to jump into the message today, and it's my great privilege and honor uh, to talk to you today about an organization that my wife and I have partnered with for a very long time. Our church has partnered with since we started, uh, going on going on ten years ago, um, and it's called Compassion International. And we're going to be talking about them today and what they do and why they do it and why it is our great privilege and honor to partner with them. And you might have noticed some, some signs out there. You might notice the, the big burlap stand thingies that we don't normally have uh, up here. And I'll obviously be explaining all of that. But I actually want to tie in what we're talking about today and why we're doing it with uh, what we talked about last week. And we finished this series called The Way of God, which is like a discipleship series last week, where we talked about four pathways that we want to focus on as a church family, that we want to help people do four things. Say it if you remember it or know it. We want to help people love God, live free, build family, bring the kingdom. That was pretty good. By the end, the first couple ones, you're like, well, I don't remember what they were. What were they? So let's try it one more time now that you do know, because... I just told them to you. We want to help people do four things. We want to help people love God, live free, build family, and bring the kingdom. And last week, we talked about that last one, how to bring the kingdom of God in our lives. The kingdom of God is the rule and reign of Jesus. And that was Jesus's mission and mandate when he was on this earth, was to bring the kingdom. We looked at Isaiah 61, 1 and 2 last week. And this is, this is one of those passages of scripture that you just will look at over and over and over and over again in your spiritual walk. At least we will as a church family. It's like John 3, 16. Because Jesus in Luke chapter 4 quoted this passage and he said, when he got done quoting, he said, this is fulfilled in your hearing. He's saying, this is about me. This is my mission. This is my mandate. So if it's that important to Jesus, it should be that important to us because we're his body here on the earth. So this is our mission. This is our mandate. Jesus quoted this. Does it just blow your mind that Jesus 2,000 years ago had the same Old Testament scriptures that we have today? Like same text. It's just been translated into English for us. Does that, that's just a side note. Does that blow anyone's mind? Like sometimes I'm reading and I read David quoting Moses and I'm just like, like, wow, David quotes Moses. And then the New Testament writers quote David who quoted Moses. And then here we are 2000 years after Jesus. Anyways, okay, I'll just move on. Um, We need to get, I think we should always stay in awe of God's word. And Man, I, some of my, one of my friends here, he said, my favorite Christian writers are all dead. <laughs> you know, like from the 1800s or, or the early 1900s. And I was like, me too. <laughs> and we were connecting over that. There's something powerful when you read a book, The Practice of the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence, written in the 1600s, which is really just letters he wrote. And you're reading it and it's so fresh. And you're like, I could preach this today. It's like grounding like our faith is deeply rooted in history and, and it's just beautiful. Anyways, all right, that's not the sermon today, but that's a, it's a beautiful thing to stay in all of the word of God. So Jesus quoted this, Isaiah 61, this was his man. They, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. That word poor can mean poor like poverty, material poverty, or it can mean poor in spirit, spiritual Poverty. So there's different kinds of poverty. There's people in the world who are in poverty in material things. And then there's us in America who we have a lot of material things. But let me tell you, oh my goodness, there is spiritual poverty in America like you wouldn't believe, right? Like Laodicean type of spiritual poverty that you say to yourselves, oh, I'm rich, I'm wealthy, I, I don't need a thing. And yet Jesus looks at us and goes, you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. You know, there's, there's different types of of poverty, and it means both types. And Jesus was sent to proclaim good news to people from all types of poverty. He has sent me, Jesus said, to bind up the brokenhearted. And how many of you know there's different types of being broken hearted? This is the healing ministry of Jesus. And then he says, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release 
from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So he's setting captives free. And how many of you know there's different types of captivity? There are, there, there's captivity to sin, but then there's captivity to oppression. We've talked about do-good missions and setting slaves free in Pakistan and people that literally get bound up in slavery, people that are oppressed in systems of injustice in this world. Poverty itself in certain areas, in certain countries, can be a system of oppression that's very difficult to get out of. And Jesus came to proclaim good news to people from, of, in all types of poverty and to set captives free from all types of captivity, to heal people of all types of brokenness. This is the ministry of Jesus. And so we said it this way last week, This is how we bring the kingdom. In the power of the Holy Spirit, we share good news and we do good deeds to set captives free. Bringing the kingdom means bringing the rule and reign of Jesus. And when the rule of reign in Jesus comes over a person or a family or an area, a region, things change. And that person, that family, that region starts to look like heaven on earth. And so Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, Father, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so when we talk about bringing the rule and reign of Jesus, we're his commissioned ambassadors. And when we see injustice, when we see people who are poor or poor in spirit, when we see people who are brokenhearted or just broken, when we see captives, we are commissioned like Jesus, by Jesus, to bring his kingdom in those situations and to set captives free, right? Amen? That's our mandate. And so as we talked about last week, what's a simple way to think about that is what is heaven like? What are we supposed to be doing? What is heaven like? And we talked about these things. In heaven, there's no sin or sinners. And so we're commissioned to preach forgiveness and grace, grace that not only forgives, but grace that empowers people to overcome sin. In heaven, there's no sickness, injury, or pain. And so we're commissioned by Jesus, by his Holy Spirit, to bring healing to this world all types of healing, physical, mental, spiritual, emotional. In heaven, there's no one oppressed by demonic spirits. And so Jesus has given us power and authority to drive them out and make them leave people alone. And we can do that again by the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. In heaven, there's no one dead. That's my favorite one. So he literally even raised the dead. And he had the audacity to tell us, heal the sick, raise the dead. Most of the time, we don't have enough faith to believe that if a friend of ours codes right next to us and dies, my wife's a nurse, so I use their language sometimes. But if, if someone kills over, that, that we have power and authority to pray and believe that Jesus can bring them back. Amen? In heaven, there's no one poor hungry, thirsty, or homeless. So Jesus always was helping the poor, feeding them, treating them kindly. And he commissioned us again to do the same. And as we talked about last week, when it comes to helping people, we're supposed to do it, no strings attached. God helps us whether we believe in him or not. Did you know that? God helps people who don't even believe in him. Did you know that? He helped you before you believed in him. You just didn't know it. (laughs) He's a God, scripture says, who sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And rain in that scripture is symbolic or metaphor or quite literal of a blessing. If we were all still farmers, we would be like, oh, that's a literal. That's not even a metaphor. (laughs) He's a God who sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. He just blesses people. He loves people. And so we want... Jesus healed people. He didn't give them interrogation and go, hold up, do you believe in me? Hold up, um, are you going to still follow me after I heal you? Are you going to be a Christian? He didn't do that. He just said, oh, you need healing? Boom, healing. Oh, you need help? Boom, help. Oh, you need food? Give me that fish and loaves. There was no quiz. He just, he just helped people. And so when we help people, hey, we're going to do it in the name of Jesus. We hope you come to believe in Jesus, but you don't have to. We're just going to help you. And so when we bring the kingdom, when we see situations or people who need help, we're supposed to bring the kingdom of Jesus, the rule and reign of Christ over their life, to help them, to help their life look like heaven on earth. Amen? And so 
Uh, that's what we are called to do. And Isaiah 58, this is a theme all throughout Scripture, all throughout Scripture. You know, one of our main pathways that we talk about is loving God. And if you were to do a Scripture study on how to love God, we talked about this several weeks ago, but it's obey His commandments, right? So if you were to break down in Scripture, especially the New Testament Scripture, what were the commands of Jesus and what are the commands of God? By far, the most commands deal with us loving other people. And when I say loving them, showing them the love of God through acts of kindness, service, generosity, good deeds that help them. Not just feeling affections. In fact, the book of James talks about that. He's like, James chapter 2. Anybody ever read James and feel like you get hit in the face with a two by four? You know? James must have been one of those left brain type A guys who's like, enough with the flowery language. Let me just tell you how it is. All right? (laughs) You know? You flowery artist spiritual guys. I'm spiritual too, but I'm going to hit you in the face with a two by four. That's, That's the book of James. All right? And he gets into this section of chapter two, and he's like, faith without deeds is dead, guys. He's like, if you meet a person who needs help, a brother or sister who needs help, they need food, they need clothing, they need water, and you go, oh, God bless you, go in peace. I got like cards stuck in my sleeve, and I'm like, I couldn't do that again if I tried. (laughs) Okay, I'm not going to go there. Anyways, (laughs) I was going to try to be funny. Anyways, um. If you see someone in need, now I'm like, is it going to do it again? Okay. If you see someone in need who needs help and you're like, oh, God bless you. Go on your way. Stay warm and well fed. But you do absolutely nothing to help them with their needs. He's like, what good is it? What good was that? You telling them. You know, this is a criticism of the world on the church at times. You guys like to sing your songs and pray your prayers, but you never do anything to make a difference. We've had people criticize us when when we do posts like, hey, pray. Oh, there's an earthquake. Pray. Oh, why don't you actually help people? And and I'm like, oh, well, we do, but (laughs) we need to pray too, and it's powerful. You just don't know. James is like, listen, you And I, we as Christians, we need to walk the walk. We need to practice what we preach and say we believe. And because he says it real plain, faith without deeds is dead. it's, It's powerless faith to say you believe something, but then go live a different way. And so all throughout the New Testament, when you read the word of God, you see that one of the biggest ways he wants us to love him is by loving other people. And you parents in this room, you know what this is like. Because your kids can be sweet as, sweet as honey to you. They're sweet as pie, you know? And you parents ever have real sweet kids, and you're just like, something's off here. What do, you, what do you want? You're being real sweet. They're sweet as pie to you. Oh, I love you. Oh, you guys are just the best parent. I was just thinking about it. I don't know why. I don't know why. I was just thinking about it the other day. You're just so great. And as soon as they leave your presence, they start punching their sisters in the face. You know what I'm saying? And you get all upset. You ever have that happen in the back seat while you're driving to church? We love Jesus in this house. We don't punch each other in the throat. (laughs) You get upset. And you're like, kids, you can tell me you love me all day long. But man, if you mistreat your siblings, that upsets me. Why? Because we want them to be loving people. And so we tell, we teach them, we we command them. Thou shalt not punch your siblings in the throat and steal their toys. Thou shalt not do it. Stop it. Why? Because the scripture says, I have no greater joy than to know that my Children are walking in the truth. Now, that was a spiritual father speaking to a church. But I think every parent, as their kids get older, agrees with that. I have no greater joy than to know that my kids are loving and respecting each other. So I command them all day long, get along, get along. Don't do that. I just want you guys to get along. You want to love me? You want to make me feel good? Get along with each other. 
And that's how God is. God's like, you can come to church. You can sing songs to me all day. You can, you can give money at church, give money to God all day. But he's like, if you go out there and you don't love each other, you don't love your fellow man, you're not listening. You know, you're not, you're not doing what I want is, is how he feels. And so when you look at the number one way for us to love God, according to scripture, by verse count, it is us loving other people. And we talked about this principle last week we see in scripture that God wants us to do good deeds to help people. And we talked about any good deeds count, right? Even a cup of cold water, you won't lose your reward, Jesus said, if you just help somebody with just a cup of cold water. Every good deed counts. But you see this principle in scripture that he wants us to help the most, the people who need the most help. And that's what you see is consistent throughout scripture. For example, in Isaiah 58, God is talking about fasting. And we just got done with 21 days of prayer and fasting last Sunday, right? Anybody still thankful for that? Yeah. It's fun to break fast and be done with fasting. Um, (laughs) The people of Israel in the Old Testament were all about prayer and fasting. They were about all the religious things. And they would do these religious things and check boxes. But God says, when you fast, you still mistreat your fellow man. You beat your employees. It's what he's, literally what he's saying. You cheat them out of money. You're not doing right. You're, you're not living moral lives. You're not treating one another fairly. But you fast because you want me to bless your life. And God's upset, and he's calling them out on it. And then he goes on to say this. After he calls them out, he says in Isaiah 58, starting in verse 6, is this, is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen, God says, to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. This is the kind of fasting God wants. Help other people. How is that fasting? Because you're not thinking about how to meet your own needs. You're denying yourself so that you can help other people. And he goes on. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and to not turn away from your own flesh and blood? Listen to what he says in verse 8. Then, he's like, if you will do these things, if you'll focus your life on helping other people, especially people who need the most help, then Your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed. Then your light will rise in the darkness. Your noon will become like, your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun scorched land and he will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with with dwellings. There's this huge list of how God is going to bless your life. He said, I just noticed it just now. Got some revelation just now. He will strengthen your frame. He'll even make your body more healthy. And he's going to bless your life. You're going to be like a well-watered garden. You're going to have all your need, abundant provision, just overflowing out of your life. All these blessings, how? When you stop chasing the blessings, when you stop asking for yourself, when you focus your life outward and start caring for other people, God says all these blessings will follow after you. God wants us as his kids to have a perspective focused outward, to be selfless people. And I think the reason that we don't so often do that, that we don't want to take up our cross, is it's like death to self. And then we think, I won't have what I need. If I don't think about myself, if I deny myself, if all I ever do is help other people, I won't get what I need. And then secretly we're like, and I won't get what I want. 
And it's that fear that causes us to live even our spiritual lives focused on ourselves so often. You know, I think if we were to analyze our prayer lives, how often are we praying for other people versus help me, help me, help me, help me. And it's the thing, same thing in our spiritual lives as we live them out. How often are we like, I'm going to do this. God wants me to do this. I'm doing this for me. I'm doing this for my church. I'm doing this for things that are going to bless me versus I'm just being selfless. I'm going to help others. God wants us, the, ob- the opposite of fear is faith. So we fear, so we stay selfish. But if we have faith, we trust what God says here. If you will deny yourself and focus on helping others, God is saying, I'm going to bless you. See, this is tied to how we bring the kingdom. Matthew 6, verse 33, he says, but seek first his kingdom. The context is us worrying, worrying about what am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What am I going to wear? We're worried. We run after all these things. We run, we spend our whole lives. We spend ourselves on behalf of those things. What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? We're going to have coffee. Is coffee going to be there? If not, we need to stop at Starbucks on the way and get the coffee. We have to have coffee. We worry about getting the things we need, which a lot of times are just things we want. We worry about, well, what are we going to wear? We got to go shopping so we can wear the right things to the thing. And then we got to stop and get the coffee on the way. We spend ourselves on these things. We're always worried about it. And God goes, don't worry. Seek first. Here's what you need to seek first. The kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God, and his righteousness. And righteousness is not just purity, moral purity in you. Righteousness is also justice, rightness in relationships, rightness in society. And so if you see or meet a family out in the world at your school and the children, they're homeless and, oh, we got to live in the motel, there's something in us that goes, that ain't right. Somebody should do something about that. Lord, will you please send someone to do something about that? Will you please help with this situation? And that's what happens when we see the brokenness in the world a lot of the time. Lord, do something. Lord, do something. Humanity is always blaming God for the brokenness in the world. There's kids starving in Africa. There's war. God, God, do something. There's people without clean water. God, do something. And I think so often God's like, I did do something. I made you. And there you are, and you know me, which means you have access to heaven's resources. And if we will step out in faith, so often God gets involved in our faith and our faith step, our action step, and he puts his Holy Spirit behind it. And then we see him do far above greater than we could ever ask or imagine. That's the fish and love story, right? Hey, send these people. These people are hungry, Jesus. Can you, can you send them away? Do something about that? You give them something to eat. What do we have? We just got a few fish, a few loaves. How far is that going to go among so many? And what does he say? Bring them to me. And he multiplies, and he feeds everybody. But that costs somebody their lunch. There's that fear. Oh, But because they gave it up, 12 basketfuls left over, and everybody got to eat. And that's God's invitation. When we see brokenness in the world, when we see lack in someone else's life, we need to start thinking, changing our thinking. I'm an agent of the kingdom of heaven, and I am commissioned to go, that ain't right. And somebody should do something, and that somebody's me. And how many of you know, we can't can't change the world for everybody. Scripture says, as you have opportunity, help people. What does that mean, as you have opportunity? I think it means as people come across your path. So we're not responsible to feed the entire world. We are responsible to feed the people that come across our path that need fed. That we can do something about. 
And so this is God's commissioning to us. And God wants us to learn how to trust him to seek the kingdom first, to have an outward focus, to say, I'm going to seek the kingdom first. I'm going to do what God wants, and I'm going to take care of other people. And Matthew 6 says, if you seek first the kingdom and his righteous, all these other things that you want and that you need, they'll be added to you. Another translation says they'll be given. So God says in Isaiah 58, if you look after others who are really in need, oh, I'm going to bless your life in all these ways, this huge list. In Matthew 6, he says, if you seek the kingdom first, oh, I'm going to give it, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to add everything that you're seeking, I'm going to give it right back to you. You won't even have to ask me for it, I'm just going to give it to you. It's kind of like that verse that, where Jesus says, you need to forgive others so that your sins will be forgiven. And then he put that in his prayer, the model prayer. And Lord, forgive me as I forgive others. Now, that's just pretty routine prayer until somebody deeply hurts you or deeply betrays you or deeply offends you. And then you're like, and Lord, forgive me. Just forgive me, Lord. (laughs) Because all of a sudden, you don't want to forgive others. So how is it that the Lord, are these like carroty dangles? Like, I'll forgive you if you forgive others. I'll provide for all your needs if you help others. I'll add everything to you if you seek the kingdom first. It's not a carrot. It's him as a good, loving, heavenly father shaping our character and making sure that we're not just always all about ourselves. (laughs) Oh, Lord, personal relationship with Jesus, love you. Forgive me and bless me and help me. And I hope those other people learn how to pray for themselves, too, because I ain't helping them. You know, he's like, as a good, loving dad, he goes, no, I want my kids focused out. Any of you parents ever witnessed a miracle with your kids where one of them actually is selfless and helps one of the others? And you're just like, oh, you do have some of my genetic material. I thought all that bad stuff, just your mom. I don't know, but there is some of me in there just kidding it's totally the opposite (laughs) in our household anyways and you you ever witnessed that one of the you're just like oh my goodness there's I, I witnessed fallen human nature in you all the time but there is some good in this world and I saw it in you just now you ever have that happen and then without telling them you're like oh they're gonna get something nice tonight I'm gonna be stopping by the dollar store (laughs) and get some dessert or a piece of candy or whatever. And then I'm going to come home and be like, oh, it's raining candy in this place. Sour gummies for everybody. And they're like, oh, dad, you're the best. Oh, I took my wife loves to eat healthy. She never buys junk food. I bring it home, and I'm like, my kids are like, we love you, Dad. <laughs> and I tell my wife, I'm like, hey, if you want to be the hero, bring, bring home some cookies tonight. Like, I'm just saying, you can be the hero, too. You just got to bring home the junk food. Anyways, you ever do that? You reward your kids. Well, Dad, why are you doing this? Here's why. I want you to know, I didn't say a word, but I noticed that you picked up for your brother and your sister, you picked up their mess. I saw you sharing, and so I made it a point to bless you. That's what God does. And so it's really a matter of trust. Are we gonna trust him to live selfless lives? Trusting that if we pour ourselves out for others, spend ourselves on behalf of the hungry, spiritually hungry, 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 (laughs) that God will take care of us. It's a matter of trust. And so he wants us to help people who need help the most. And it starts at home. It starts with your own family. Jesus said, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jerusalem is your hometown, your home city, right? Starts in your home home, then it's your hometown, your home city, And then from there, Judea and Samaria, that's the region you live in. He wants you to impact the region you live in. And then from there to the ends of the earth, as you have opportunity. 
as people come across your path from all walks of life, in your hometown, in your region, across the earth. So Compassion International came across my path over 20 years ago. And I was in high school, and um, my high school youth group decided, uh, my youth pastor, uh, had he heard about Compassion, and he pitched this to us. He said, what if we sponsor a child as a group, and we give, we give youth offerings to the youth group, and we'll pay for this sponsorship for this child, and, uh, and then we'll take turns writing them letters. And so we did that, and we picked a child that was about our age at, in high school at the time, and we did that for the rest of the time that I was in high school. And it was this really awesome thing. That was my introduction to Compassion International. Probably four or five years later, my wife and I had just gotten married, and uh, we were at a concert, I believe, or something like that, or maybe at our college. And we had the opportunity to uh, sponsor a child through Compassion International. And his name uh, was Brian Jose Alarcon Landa from Ecuador. And we sponsored him. He was very young, like seven, eight years old when we started sponsoring him. And we sponsored him until he graduated from their program when he was about 18 uh, years old. And so we had an opportunity to build a relationship with him and write him letters. And it was, it was really, really amazing. Um, how many of you have heard of Compassion and kind of know basically what they do? Awesome. So that's probably over half of you, which is amazing. Um, for those of you who don't, basically what Compassion is, it was started by uh, a Christian man who went on a mission trip and saw children, like homeless street children, who were in deplorable situations and nobody was helping them. And he began to help them best he could, and God blessed his efforts enormously. And he ended up getting lots of other people involved and starting a sponsorship program, and then it grew from there. Uh, actually, the man who started this was part of a group of churches called Converge. Converge is the group of churches that we are a part of. Um, that they are a church uh, planting organization, and, and we partnered with them to start uh, our church. And so that's some of the cool history of Compassion. Um, and so basically what it is is now they're all over the world. They're in lots of different countries, and they partner with local churches in whatever country they're in, in whatever city they're in. And through these local churches, they will start a, a project or a Compassion Center, and the basic of it, the basics of it is it's, it's kind of works what, kind of like what we would call an after-school program where uh, if, kids, if the kids are going to school, after school, they'll go to the Compassion Program. Um, some of them don't go to school, and they just go to the Compassion Program, and the, it just depends which one uh, that they're a part of. It's usually four to five days a week for a few hours, and the kids that are a part of this will receive every day that they're there a really good nourishing meal, clothing. They will get education and help with their school homework if they're in school, tutoring and whatnot. And because this is all Christian-based, they get teaching about Jesus. And so they have the opportunity to learn about Jesus and uh, are presented with the gospel uh, to make a decision for Christ at some point in their life. Children who are part of their, their, these programs are many times more likely to graduate from high school. And Compassion operates in areas of the world that need the most help. And so I mentioned last week when people are in deep cycles of poverty, very often they can't get out of that without some type of help from the, from the outside. And then once they get out of it, then they're able to, to get their lives set up to where they're out of that cycle of poverty. And that's really what Compassion helps do. Their, their mission statement is releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name. And so currently it is $38 a month to sponsor a child and give them, again, four to five days a week, food, clothing, education, and teaching about Jesus. And they, they will start kids as young as four or five years old. They'll be in the program all the way up till the time they're 18. So if you can imagine that on a consistent basis daily, um, it's pretty powerful and it's pretty amazing. So my wife and I were sponsoring uh, Brian Jose Larkin Landa, building a relationship with him. Um, and we had a, a Compassion Day at, here at our church uh, towards the beginning. 
and we focused on the country of Uganda because we had missionaries there and we're doing a lot of other stuff there. And we sponsored another child named Honest Patience from uh, Uganda. And that's, that was really my wife's, the one that my wife uh, corresponded with or still corresponds with. Um, and I was focused on Brian. Um, in 2018, I got the opportunity to go to Guatemala with Compassion International. And it was a very short trip. And it's what they would call a vision trip for pastors. So I went with like 20 other pastors and a few of Compassion's people. And while we were in Guatemala, my, my daughter Isabel got to go with me. It was just such a special trip for the both of us. But we went to three different compassion centers in Guatemala to see how they operate. And I knew that compassion was a good organization to be involved with before that. When I experienced what I did on that trip, I was blown away uh, with their integrity and with their excellence and how they, how they do the partnership with the local church. Um, at all three of these centers, we got to meet the pastor of the church that was hosting it. We got to meet a lot of the volunteers. This is mostly a volunteer-led organization at the ground level. Um, they obviously have a lot of, of administrative staff who work for Compassion, um, but they really their main job is empowering all the volunteers that do the work at the ground level. So if this, if this was in our community in America, it would like our church would host this program. We've had a bun We've had the average Compassion Center has about 150 kids. Can you imagine 150 kids coming to our church four or five days a week? And we have a bunch of volunteers and volunteers from other churches who teach them, who train them in Jesus, help them with their homework, uh, give, give them a meal, give them clothes, and, and work with them on a, on a daily basis. It's really a powerful, powerful program. Um, while we were there visiting, just to give you an example, when you're sponsoring a child, um, you have the opportunity to, to like, you know, you build a relationship one-on-one -on -one with this child. And, and that's actually harder for compassion to facilitate, but there's a lot more power in it because you can pray for that child very specifically. You can love on them and encourage them in a way that if they didn't do that, uh, they, there's no way that their staff could do that for all these kids. And so it's, it's a really genius way of going about it, um, and it's a beautiful thing. And so uh, while we were there visiting, for example, you can also do like a birthday present, you know, and like give 20 extra dollars for their birthday. And, and they'll get them a, a birthday gift and be like, oh, this is from your sponsor. And it's a really cool thing. Well, while we were there, we, we got to meet all these people. It was amazing to see it, how it works in real life. It was just like, wow. And they took us in the office in two of the locations. They were like, take them in the office. And I'll never forget these ginormous filing cabinets. And they said, Shh, just pick a random file of one of the kids that's been in the program. And they pull open the drawer. And they just reach in and grab one. It was like a, a little boy, I believe, that had been in the program like, I don't know, three or four years. Files like super thick. Pulls it out. They're like, just show them what's in the file. They had records in this file of all types, of like their progress in school, of their family home life. Does the family need extra help? Because sometimes when there's extra, they'll even send food home with them for their families. Um, all kinds of notes about their family, about the needs of the family. They even have a way that compassion tracks their spiritual progress and like certain steps on their spiritual journey. Have they accepted Christ or not yet? And they showed us this kid. Oh, this kid has accepted Christ. Oh, that's good. Has he been baptized? Oh, okay. Where is he at now? You know, how's he doing with his faith? I was blown away. And then they go, show them like the birthday gift thing. And they're like, oh, okay. So you give $38 a month. 80% of that goes to like your child and the program they're a part of. The other 20% goes to Compassion's administrative costs for the people that work there to pay them and, and do everything that they do. So they're looking through this particular child's folder and they're like, oh, look at this. Yeah, the sponsor got him a Christmas or a, a birthday gift last year. It was $20. Uh, looks like, and they had a record there. They got, you know, it was like two pair of jeans, two pair of socks, and, and a few other things. And they said, and here's all the receipts. And they had receipts for every single item, and the exact total was like $20.11. I was blown away. And I was like, they showed us that on purpose to, get, to go, because when you're talking to people about sponsoring children, one of, one of the biggest questions is, can I trust this organization to steward 
what, that's, that's a big commitment, $38 a month, and you want to know that it's being stewarded well and with integrity. And they were showing us this to go, and they told us, we do regular checks with all of our sponsorship locations to make sure that they are doing this for every single child because we have to assure that the money is being stewarded properly for what it's supposed to be for. And they said, we even have a process that if a location, a compassion center, starts stop, starts to stop to do that, they'll kind of warn them, they'll have trainings, they'll work with them. And if it keeps happening, they're like, you could be in danger of losing this program in your community because we have to keep our ethical standards absolutely high. And when I saw all that, I went, now this makes sense to me. Why compassion is so successful and they're so prevalent. And I believe it's because of the blessing and favor of God on compassion as an organization because of their ethical standards and how they do things. They really, everyone I've ever met from compassion, they really truly care about the kids and keeping it about helping kids. And so it's a beautiful organization. Uh, We got to experience all that while we were in Guatemala, and I think it was a short time, maybe six months, a year before that, that Brian Jose uh, had graduated the program and was moving on in life, and so obviously our sponsorship ended with him, and so while we were in Guatemala, they said, does anybody here want to sponsor another child, um, or, or a child, period, if you haven't sponsored one yet, and so we had talked about that as a family before I went, and I was like, yeah, we would be interested And uh, they said, okay. And we were on our way to one of these compassion centers. And they said, uh, they made some phone calls on the bus. And there's, most compassion centers, there's a wait list of kids who want to get in the program, but there's not enough sponsors yet. And that was the case at this one. And um, they called this lady and they said, hey, you know, your child's next on the list. There's some people who are interested in sponsoring your son. Can you meet us at the center we're going to be there in two hours. And she's like, what do you mean you're going to be there? They're like, they're here in the country, and they're going to be at that center, your compassion center, in about two hours. She's like, okay. She was at work. They told us later she left. I don't know what she told her boss, but left work, grabbed her child, and and got him there. Um, And I got to meet him. His name's Anderson. This is a picture of me and Anderson and my daughter who got to go with me. That's Anderson, and he was just the coolest little kid. When I saw his little red Chuck Taylors, I thought, "This we're cut from the same cloth, buddy, and this is going to go well. And uh, I got a little video of, of him playing catch with another one of the guys. He's just the cutest kid. Look at that smile. I mean, <laughs> he's just so awesome. And uh, they told us, that part of the reason he's in this situation that he's in is uh, it's his mom's only child, and dad was like, I'm going to go off to the city to find better work. I'll send money back, and then they never heard from dad. And that's, that's a common story that happens uh, a lot, unfortunately, in that, in that region. And so she was doing whatever she could, working odd jobs to try to provide, and it, it just was not enough for him. And so uh, I've been sponsoring him. We've been sponsoring him as a family now for four years so he's, he's about four there. He's about eight now. And it's just awesome. And as I said, you get to write letters, build a relationship with the family. Compassion does regular trips where you can actually um, go meet the children uh, that you sponsor, meet them in person, and build that relationship even more. And so um, it's, it's a really, really incredible thing uh, that compassion does. And... I've got a little more to talk about, and I'm trying to think about if I want to tell you now or, or tell you here in a few minutes. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to tell you now. Um, so this past year, um, I stayed in touch with one of the guys I went to Guatemala with who works with Compassion. His name's Matt uh, Kitchen, and uh, I, he was talking to me last year about our church and what's going on, and I was like, yeah, we're, we're getting ready to, we just bought land. We want to build a new building. We've, we started a fundraising campaign and we're trying to raise a lot of money and you know I said but I I told our leadership team 
and our staff, you know, even though we quote unquote need lots of money right now, I don't want us to, to lose our heart for people and to, to still be generous because that's how the kingdom works. In the world, if you need lots of money, it's like, I can't help anybody. I can't do anything. I need too much right now, right? In the kingdom, as we've talked about, God wants us to maintain generosity no matter what. And so we started this capital campaign. We were trying to raise all this money for, for us, but we still re- want to remain generous. And I talked to Matt. I was like, man, it's been a while since we've done a Compassion Day. Maybe we could think about that at church. And he goes, all right, well, I, I want to throw this at you and see what you think about it. And he said, you know, where you visit in Guatemala is kind of the southern part. In the northern part of the country, uh, we're, we're, we've got that identified as a place that we would love to start a new compassion center. And we even have a partner church identified. We just need the funds to get it going. And he said the startup cost to, to get, get a whole program off the ground and running is about $30,000 uh, at least in Guatemala. And so um, I talked to our staff and leadership team, and we began praying about that. And um, we started feeling really compelled that we were supposed to do it. Um, but we just started this capital campaign, and we didn't want to you know, ask the church, be like, everybody give a bunch of money to this. Okay, now everybody give a bunch of money to this over here. And, and so what we decided to do last year was, uh, you know, we'd already started the capital campaign, and everybody was giving to that. We're like, you know what? We, we prayed about this, and we're like, we're going to do it. We decided to take $30,000 from our savings and give it to Compassion to start this new Compassion Center in uh, Guatemala. And so we did that. And we talked about that a few times last year, but if maybe you missed those weeks, you might still be unaware that we actually did do that. Um, but we did it. And within a few months, Matt's like, hey, this has been, we've been waiting on this a long time, so it's ready, like, and we're getting the ball rolling, like, it's, it's getting started. There's actually a website that you can go to that's got pictures of the, the pastor of the host church, of a bunch of the kids and volunteers of the Compassion Center that we started last year. It is freepeople.church slash compassion. If you go to that website, you can read all about the center that we started. Um, it's in a uh, northern Guatemala and I believe it's called Peten, if I am pronouncing that right, Peten, Guatemala. And the sponsor church is Iglesia del Nazareno, which is like Church of the Nazarene, right? And the Compassion Center is called Chosen Lineage. The average Compassion Center uh, will host about 150 kids because of the need in this area. The one that we started last year um, is going to host about 240 kids starting out. Um, as you can see, we've got these displays up here with a bunch of packets like this, which are individual children who need sponsored. Every single one that you see up here is from the Compassion Center that we started last year. And so if you sponsor one of those children, it will be one at, one, at that Compassion Center. And we're just dreaming at this point, but I've definitely been talking to, to Matt, our compassion rep guy, um, that they do trips all the time. And if we have a large number of people uh, who sponsor from one area, we could, we could totally arrange a trip uh, in the next couple of years to go. You could go meet uh, your compassion child, which is a super awesome thing as, you know, getting that opportunity a few years ago. Um, it's really special to be able to do that. So, um, so these are our kids, <laughs> uh, and, and we feel responsible, and we want to put this opportunity before you, and I want to explain how we're going to do that in a few minutes, but before I do, we also have a special guest with us today, and this special guest, his name is Daniel Cross, and he is from the Dominican Republic, and Daniel is a Compassion alumni. Uh, which means that he grew up going to a compassion program in the Dominican Republic. And so uh, you've heard from someone who has sponsored a child. You've heard from someone who's got to visit and see how they do things on the ground as an observer. Now you're going to get to hear from someone who has lived, growing up, going to 
a compassion uh, program in the Dominican Republic. So would you please join me in giving a warm free people welcome to Daniel Cross as he comes and speaks for us today. Yes. Bless you. Hey guys, I'm so excited to be here. Uh, yesterday I took a fly at 1 p.m. to New Jersey. I got there by 4 p.m. Then I took another one to Cincinnati. And then I drove all the way from Cincinnati. <laughs> and to be honest, I just, I was happy, I was excited. And I, and I'm, I have K-Love, the, the, the radio station, all the way up. And I'm watching all the buildings and all the beautiful things that you have. And, and, and I'm like, I'm in a little heaven right now. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm, I'm kind of jealous because, you know, I wish I grew up here. But to be honest, uh, what I grew up is called Sal Si Puedes. Sal Si Puedes is a word in Spanish that means get out of there if you can. <laughs> <laughs> the name is funny, but to be honest, the, the reason being is because people, it's very hard for people to get out of that place because, you know, it's very well known for drug dealers prostitution, if, you, if we can see that on the screen. Um, it's very tough to be in South si Puedes, actually. And uh, if we go right now there, you'll get to see children transporting drugs from one location to the other used by adults. Um, and, and that is happening every, every day. And, and you know, teenagers being used in, in activities, they are not willing to do so. And, um, you know, coming from that place, I, I never get used to talk about that because it's got quite hard. Uh, in the first service, I didn't get to talk a lot about that, and I just realized that now. And I'm trying to speak a little bit more about it. Um, you know, uh, growing up there, it's, it's quite tough because you are exposed to things that, like, you didn't choose to. And um, if I think about the house that w w what I grew up, it was full of holes on the roof, so the water seeped in every time it rained. It was quite crazy. Here you have pets, dogs, and things like that. There we had mice and roaches. And um, actually, you know, it's it's... It's very tough to live uh, there because something that happens when you're living in poverty is that you, you believe that the neighborhood is the world. But actually, um, you, don't know that, you don't know that there's something else outside. And, and, and all what you have is, well, if you don't kill, you don't survive. You, you need to do something in order to. And the other day, I just, I just ran into one of the news from the, let's say, the local news. And I saw a guy that grew up with me. He, he didn't have the opportunity that I had, and, and, and he was running a, a what we call Punto, which is a little location that they use to distribute drugs. And what they actually do is, I mean, if I'm, if I'm selling something here and you have something in, in the other corner, and we're selling the same thing, then we need to fight for the, for the territory. But the sad thing about that is that this guy named Christopher ended up killing his own brother in order to fight for territory. You know how confused people are living there uh, without thinking there is another choice, there's another opportunity. And I want to show you uh, the backyard of my house, what used to be the backyard. And it's coming, it's coming. There it is. That's my brother right there, that's my mom. And uh, we used to, like that was her barbershop, let's say. <laughs> There we just used to do everything. I, I grew up in that backyard. And I remember playing those cans 
like a drum, like that was milk cans that, that were there set up for me to be able to play the drums because I just developed that passion for uh, playing the drums. And the thing is, the first time I got to go to a barber shop, then the next day people were like, man, there's something in you, I don't know, I don't know what it is, like there is something different in you, what's going on? And the thing is, my mom was terrible doing that. <laughs> And, you know, they, they just notice the difference. <laughs> and, and I want to say this, like, most of the time when we're dealing with hard things, not only people living in poverty, but, but we, all of us, we try to fight in our own. Like, we need to get out of that situation, and we need to fight, and we try hard as possible. And I want to bring a little story about a guy that, that was trying to learn how to swim. And he's, he's just going to swimming lessons. And the first day of lesson, he got there 30 minutes before. And, you know, he was so excited to learn how to swim that he just jumped into the pool without a trainer. Five seconds after, he just noticed he didn't know how to swim. Is trying to survive, and then the trainer got there, and, and, and the trainer is watching what's going on, and the people is asking, why don't you go and save him? He's going to die. And he said, if I go and save him, then chances are he's going to take me down. So sometimes for us to be safe, we need to be in a vulnerable situation that hard that we just fight and fight and fight and can't get out of there. But then we find Jesus who can do everything that we can't do. And that, that is what happened with my family. We find this organization called Compassion because you know, guys, that God, use, he uses a lot of resources. He uses a lot of ministries. He uses a lot of people to help us. Like he can't, he won't come again. I mean, he, he will come again. But what I'm, what I'm trying to, to explain is every time that we have a problem, Jesus uses something or someone. In my case, it was compassion. So let's, let's see what compassion looked like compared to my neighborhood. It was in a special place made for us. And, you know, it was a life-changing opportunity. Like, if you see it, you may say, well, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem that interesting. But honestly, guys... It was shocked, like I don't have words to explain how the center impacts my life. First Bible, I got it from there. First, first uh, computer classes. I must say that in my community, the first computers that we had was in Compassion. Like people from the community passed by and they stopped to see computers. Like little mon monkeys, when you give them <laughs> a phone or something, they just get crazy. That was our reaction. And that was me getting education thanks to, to the program. And you know something? I was practicing how to play drums in those cans of milk. And when I got there, I saw a drum from the, for the first time. I saw instruments. And now I'm, I have a teacher teaching me how to play the drums. But then, when I turned 12, something happened. And this applies not, not only for in my life or because I was living in poverty. This is, this is happening with many people, Christians and not Christians. The devil, he knows what God wants, wants to do in your life. And he will always tell you the upside, but with logical things, things that make sense. And 
what happened with me is I, I, I got um, a disease called Pertis, which is that the, the, he, the head of the bone of the femur, I lose the, the, the head of the bone, so I couldn't walk again. And I went into a surgery, and actually Compassion covered all the expenses for that, for that um, surgery. And I thought it was only, I mean, I was 12. I thought it was only going to be like three weeks, two weeks of recovery. But actually, I spent a lot of time in wheelchair. I spent a lot of time laying in, in the bed. And I remember my, my, most of my, my um, um, roommates, not roommates, but um, all of the, all of the children that were with, uh, in the same classroom with me, they went there, they were praying for me. I was getting letters from my sponsor saying, I know something's going on with your hip. We just pray and we know you're going to walk again. That is faith. And uh, let's see if, I, if we find the, the picture of what I'm playing the drums. There you go. Guys, I got recovered. <laughs> I became one of the most talented musicians of my city, and then I went to the conservatory of music. I was, for two years, I was the highest grade in all the conservatory of music. Um, we, we speak, we're talking about talented musicians and, and prepared people in that field. And, um, I got a letter one day from my sponsors, and this is interesting because, you know, like people say, always people, sponsors come to me asking, why should I tell them, what should I say, um, should I say something, um, I don't know, special or whatever, and you just have to say what is going on in your life, simple, uh, like an everyday, uh, a daily basis uh, thing. Because like when you say, here is in, it's snowing, for example. We don't see snow. Or like my, my, my uh, the Kyle, we, uh, who was the, my sponsor's son. He told me one day, I have snake. We have, we have a pet, it's snake. And he sent me a picture. I was... I went to the community and was showing that to all the people. My sponsor child, my sponsor has a snake. Look, look at it. it they have it, they have it in, in their home. Because that is something that never happened there. It is simple, but can change the life of someone. And then we have here this letter saying, Emily, who's the, my sponsor's daughter, has started her last year of college. She's looking forward to graduating in 2007 with her degree in music composition. She never know that 16 years later, I will become a, a music educator. But not only that, if we can see here in this video, we're making albums of music for kids living in poverty. And I'm doing that for compassion. So they have thousands and thousands of kids that speak Spanish. We're just making songs to teach the Bible, to teach education through music. I became what the daughter of my sponsor child was. And what I want to say here, what I, I want to encourage you guys, is that this applies to any, any of us. Sometimes God wants to do something with us, and he has spoken with us, and we know his intention. But the devil is telling us a lot of things that make sense, 
Like, if the devil told me, you can't do it, it's not possible, it was true. It wasn't possible. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. Coming from the neighborhood to get invited by Berkeley College of Music, one of the most prestigious, prestigious college of music around the world, because one of my compositions, are you kidding me? And the reason why I'm here is not because I'm a good speaker. In fact, we speak Spanish in the Dominican Republic, so you got to see how I, how I struggle with English. The reason being is because I have a testimony. God is doing something with someone you, may, you, you don't know, probably. And I can't understand how someone take the decision to go to one of those packets and see hope in their faces. It's impossible to see that. It's impossible to, t to think that one guy like me was going to do that. And I always say this, you can get a degree, you can get wealthy, you can do a lot of things, But when you die, nobody cares. Like, I can have $7 million. dollars. I can do a lot of things. At the end of the day, who cares? What makes this important is that I'm doing this for eternity. When one of those kids that are listening to that music become a child of God, make their decision for their salvation, That is going to have an eternal impact. And some of us are getting so distracted with what we see, with what we have, that we can't see our opportunity to do ministry. I'm not saying that if you don't sponsor a child, you don't, you're not doing ministry. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying this is one of the ways that you can do ministry. Thank you. Wow. Got to hear a little more of his story this service, and it's awesome. Uh, professional drummer, conservatory music, helping make music for kids, and saw his first drum set at a, at a Compassion Center. That's just incredible. Uh, thank you so much for sharing, Daniel. Um, we just want to close today by giving you an opportunity to pray about sponsoring a child through Compassion International. And, uh, and so we have these packets up here on both sides. Um, all of these are from uh, the center that we helped start last year. Um, I do want to ask our ministry team to go ahead and come on up and, and come up real close to the steps here so that if people want to check out the packets, you know, we're not in the way of that. So come up and just line up real close to the steps here. And uh, we're going to kind of transition into a... a a time where I, would, I just want to give you a few minutes to pray, or if you have your spouse here with you and you need to talk this over, uh, you can do that right now. And just take a few minutes to do that. Um, and then after that, uh, we're going to have, uh, you know, you can come up, you can check out the packets and pick out a child if you want to support one, or you can come up, ask more questions. Um, And then if, as we're dismissing and, and whatnot, also, if you need prayer for anything, um, if you want to talk about accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior, or if you need prayer for anything, our ministry team's also going to be available for you uh, to receive prayer for anything else. So what I would like to do is just take a few minutes right now and just pray about if the Lord would have you do this. I know a few times in my life on different opportunities I'm thinking, nope, can't do it. I already know. Know the financial situation, just can't do it. And then I pray about it, and God's like, you're doing it. <laughs> and, uh, and he makes a way uh, in, those, in those moments. Um, and so pray about it um, and see what the Lord might have you do uh, to, to put our love into action. Amen? 
So take a few minutes right now, just pray about it, and then um, I want to have Daniel come back up and, and do a closing prayer at that time, um, and then can decide what you want to do. So just take a few minutes, pray about it. Danny, would you come up and, and close us in prayer today? Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, God, for giving me the opportunity to share with these people. God, I ask you to keep healing in this place, to keep putting our heart closer to you, God, that we can really understand what is this all about? God, that we don't play full this game, that we can win at the end of the day. God, thank you because you're opening doors for this church. Thank you, God, because you are providing them. And thank you, Lord, because they just saying thank you and just giving back what they just received before. Gracias, Señor, porque tu fidelidad nunca cambiará a Dios. Señor, te agradezco por lo bueno que has sido, Señor, conmigo. Señor, te pido que toque sus corazones en el nombre de Jesús y que tu misericordia les alcance, Dios. Que ellos puedan ser fructíferos y que tu propósito se pueda cumplir en sus vidas. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Can you guys thank Daniel one more time? Yes. So pray for him. Uh, we're going to spend some time with him and pray for him later on too. But pray for him as he's heading back tomorrow. Um, flew in yesterday leaving tomorrow morning, so uh, just pray for him for safe travels and everything. Um, I have a packet in my hand right now for a little girl named Adelie, um, and she was born on July 28th, 2017. Uh, is there anyone who would say, I would want to sponsor this little girl right now? Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, a couple things for people who are choosing to sponsor children. Um, you can take those packets home so you have a picture of them. But there is a card we need you to fill out uh, and, and leave with us so that we have an ac accurate record that will turn into compassion. You can also, there's a QR code you can scan with your phone and fill stuff out and do it that way. Um, if you're, you're welcome to come out. Uh, come up and check out the, the boards as we're dismissing. If you're not sure yet uh, what you're going to do, please do not take a packet home um, because the, we are the only people in the world who have these kids right now, um, and that's on purpose. Um, and if you were to take that home and then not sponsor them, that child can kind of get lost in the system for up to several months, and then they won't be out there for other people to potentially sponsor. So if you're not sure yet, just don't take it home yet. Uh, please come up, check it out today before you leave. We are going to hang on to these packets for a few more weeks, and then we have to send them back, the ones that didn't get sponsored yet. Um, so you do have some time to make a decision if you need to talk to a spouse or, or think more about it um, and come up with a financial plan or however you're going to do it. Um, 
So I think that's all that I needed to say about all that. Oh, if you're watching online still, if we are still streaming, uh, you can go to a website. It is compassion.com slash FPC. And there are children there available. That's a page for our church that you can go to and see children who are available that you can sponsor. Uh, and you can sign it all up online to sponsor those children. Uh, so if you never come here in person, you can still uh, sponsor a child through Compassion today. Um, with that being said, I'm going to pray over you, and then you'll be dismissed. And if, again, if you, need, if you need prayer, please come up and let us, our ministry team pray over you before you leave today. Jesus, we just thank you so much for this awesome day at church today, God. Thank you that Daniel could come today. Bless his travels. Keep him safe, Lord. And just bless his life. Thank you so much for him and his testimony that you've given him and how your hand has been on his life. Uh, God, we thank you for compassion. Bless compassion as an, organiza as an organization. Bless the people who work there uh, to enable them to continue doing what they do. Such amazing work all around the world. God, thank you for every single family that's choosing to sponsor a child today. And uh, just bless these children and bless these sponsorships. I pray that they would build awesome, meaningful relationships and uh, that they can pray into these children's lives and encourage them in the faith um, to see them grow up and live healthy, loving, productive, faith-filled lives. And we just thank you for this opportunity today, Jesus. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.